everyone, and welcome to our Monterey's Magical History Tour with Tim Thomas. Thank you guys all for joining us. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the other doc, J.B. Phillips and the California Department of Fish and Game. Uh, just a couple house rules before we start. Um, I do ask that everyone mute themselves during the presentation um, just to help with any distractions. And then also, um, if you have any questions that arise throughout the presentation, please feel free to send them in the, in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat or hold off until the very end. We'll have some time to uh, do some Q&A at the end. So um, at that, I turn it over to Tim. All right. Thank you, Sean. And welcome, everybody, to the uh, third program of Monterey's Magical History Tour. Um, today's program actually is fairly near and dear to my heart. Um, those of you who know me, uh, you know, I am a fisheries historian and have researched the human history of Monterey Bay for about 30 years or so now. And J.B. Phillips is a name that I used to run across all the time. In fact, my whole history of J.B. Phillips started about 30 years ago when I began to start looking at the fisheries history and I began to utilize those old fishing game bulletins, uh, the fish bulletins, I don't think they still produce them like they used to, but those ones that came out in the 20s and 30s were really beautiful little pieces of history that would chronicle the different um, monthly reports. They're full of all kinds of excellent information. They were always contemporary over their time, and they're mainly written by biologists of fish and game. I actually believe the first bulletin was written in 1913, and it was about the Monterey Abilene industry. And the writer, who I believe was a professor at UCLA at the time, actually went diving with those Japanese divers and wrote these wonderful, wonderful descriptions of the underwater Monterey Bay at that time. But the one name that always stood up was, uh, that came out to me was the writer of those pieces was J.D. Phillips. Uh, Phillips was a fishing game biologist who spent his entire career here in Monterey. But he was born and raised by a single mother in Washington State. His mother actually was a cook in a lumber camp. And he went to, to the University of Washington early 1920s and came to work for Fish and Game in 1926. He actually kept everything and he kept the actual letter uh, that from Fish and Game offering him the job. It actually says on the letter, I've seen it, it says, the canners are opening soon. Please get to Monterey as soon as possible. Fish and Game actually opened his first office here in Monterey at Hopkins Marine Station in 1919 primarily because of the rapid growth of the sardine fishery. And they could, and also at Hopkins, they could be close to all the canneries. And they were here to monitor the Monterey sardine fishery. Usual practice was then to go into the canneries every morning, they went to each, every cannery, where the boat, where they, uh, when the boats came in, which could be very early in the morning, and they would meet the fishermen, uh, and fishing game kept records, what they, what they called interview cards. Uh, and they kept records of how much they caught, where they're catching them. They also took samples of these sardines they were catching. They put them in buckets and they bring them back to the lab at Hopkins where they would weigh them and measure them and sex them. And then this is the best part. They put them back in the buckets and then take them back to the canneries so the canneries wouldn't lose any fish. Uh, and they went to every cannery to do this. And most of these canneries were within walking distance with the exception of of the Booth Cannery, which was actually right next to the Monterey Wharf, and the only cannery that was in Monterey proper at that time. And so you, so the official game at that time didn't have a car. Uh, so uh, the Julie Phelps used to have to walk up to Lighthouse Avenue and get on the trolley that used to run down Lighthouse and take the trolley all the way down to downtown Monterey to get to the Booth Cannery to collect his samples and his interview cards for the fishermen. Of course, he'd load up the buckets, get on the trolley, and then get down the cannery, and then load up the, of course, the buckets. Once you put the fish in, you got to fill up with water. So he has to fill up the bucket with water, put them back onto the onto the trolley. And of course, the trolley's movement would cause the buckets to, to slosh water all over the floor and onto people's shoes. And so the other people on the trolleys would complain. And so Julie pushed and pushed and pushed to get fish and game to buy a car. Uh, it took him a couple of seasons, but eventually they did buy a car that he could take down to do that kind of work there. Um, I never actually met Julie Phillips. He passed away in the early 1990s, but I did meet his sons. His son, Don, told me that dad was a very secretive person. Uh, yeah, uh, 
about what he, and he's very secret about what he did. All we knew was that dad worked for the state and had something to do with fish. When they cleaned out the house after the parents had died, he found all of his papers, notes, journals, and photographs. And he handed me a file box that contained about 500 photographs and negatives that chronicles the history of the fisheries of Monterey from about 1925 to the early 1970s. It is the most important photo collection for Monterey fisheries that exists. There is nothing like it. On the back of each image is the who, what, and where. It is absolutely remarkable. There are things we had never seen before, things we only had heard of. That collection, I'm proud to say, now lives at the Monterey Library in the California History Room. So it is open to the public. And if we have time today, I'm going to show some of the photographs. But uh, actually what I decided to do today is we're going to uh, extend this program into two parts. So next month, we're gonna continue this, but we're gonna focus all on his photographs and, and show a number of them next month. But I, so I'm gonna introduce my guest today and I'm really honored to have uh, uh, Dr. Richard Parrish. Uh, Richard is, uh, is a, also a fisheries biologist uh, who was in Monterey in the early beginning in the 1960s. But to our purposes today, Richard actually worked with Julie Phillips at his office at Hopkins Marine Station. And so I'm, uh, I'm gonna turn over to you, Richard. So thank you for being here today. Okay, thank you, Ken. Uh, I have a PowerPoint, so I'll spend most of the time on that. <clears throat> I'll just mention that uh, a lot of the fish that were sampled at the canneries were uh, brought to Hopkins and Marine Station. And we, when I was there, we used to go over and get a pail of squid and tell, tell them we were sampling. <laughs> and that was given to the various students to eat. So they were sampled primarily by eating them. And I understand that. That happened a fair amount with Julie as well. <laughs> sure. so I'll go ahead and start the PowerPoint. So can you see that now? Not yet. Um, did you click share screen? Okay, I think that should do it. Perfect. Okay. Uh, this is me when I arrived uh, at Hopkins Marine Station uh, in 1966. And as Tim mentioned, Julie arrived in the same office in 1926. And that window that you see behind me there, you look out that and you could see whether they were working at, at Hobden Cannery and you could look right down the row of the canneries. And when I was there, there were only, when I came in 66, there were only two canneries still operating. And that was the Hobden cannery that was packing only squid and the cannery in Moss Landing uh, that was canning uh, primarily anchovies, reducing anchovies and also canning uh, jack mackerel and squid. Over the years, the number of people built up rather slowly. From 1926 to 1966, Julie was the only fisheries biologist working on Monterey Bay. Occasionally some would come in for a short period of time, but that was basically all there was. In 1966, I arrived, and so that meant there were two of us here. In 1966, working on the uh, bottom fishes and the plastics fishes, the department fishing game at that time, there was one biologist, Julie, who was responsible for commercial rockfish, round ground fish, hakes, lingcod. And he would, of course, located Hopkins Pacific Grove and he had covered the entire state. There were three biologists under Tom Zhao who covered commercial flatfish and they were in Menlo Park. I came in uh, with the small pelagic program, sampling anchovies and sardines. And then there was one biologist by the name of Dan Miller who worked on recreational ground fish and he was in Menlo Park. So in 1965, the UC Santa Cruz was founded. There were no fishers biologists, but it looked like we would at least get some more marine biologists. 1966, Moss Landing Marine Lab was established. Again, no fishers biologists. And I ended up teaching three courses on fishes at Moss Landing Marine Lab in the early years. In 1968, Dan Miller and three assistants moved to Cannery Row. 1970, 
The Monterey Fish and Game Office was established in 1976. There was a National Marine Fishery Service lab established here. And I came back, I was actually came in 1966 to work for them. I worked for the state for six years and then I left to work in the Indian Ocean on a, a survey in the Sultan of Oman. And when we came back to men, I went back to my doctorate. And then I came as one of the first members of the National Marine Fishery Service in 76. And in 1999, they opened the National Marine Fishery Service in Santa Cruz. So now there are 2021, there are actually more marine biologists than there are commercial fishing boats. This is a map showing the commercial fishing boats from 1980 in Monterey Bay area. There are about 1,400. And at the end there, you can see where they were down to a, uh, just a bit over 100. This is a very nice paper done by John Field and Francis. Bob Field is at the UC, at the Santa Cruz National Marine Fisheries Lab. Francis was at the University of Washington. It shows the history of the development of the whole California <clears throat> exploitation. As you can see that sea otters and fur seals were fished back in the early 1800s. First pulse of California whaling in the mid 1800s. Elephant seals were fished to commercial extinction by about 1870. The fur seals were depleted uh, in the early 1920s. Another bound of whaling came in and then if you look down at that green part on the bottom, that's the salmon landings over time. The next row up are flatfish. The blue is round fish, reds rockfish, shellfish, the purple is hake. And then that big blue one is the first sardine outbreak. The second patch of blue here was anchovy fishery. And the third patch of blue was again uh, the sardine fishery. One of the advantages of having spent about two years, three years working with Julie is he was known by everyone in the fishery community here. And he took me out to meet people and I was introduced to people by him and that gave me a really leg up. I would have had a hard time adjusting into the fishing community if it hadn't been by Julie. And one of the people that he introduced me to was Joe Panisi. Joe Panisi was born the same year I was in 1939. And when he was, his dad was a trawler in Monterey Bay and they had this boat, the San Giovanni. Well, Joe's father died when he was 16 years old and he took over running the boat when he was 16. And so by the time I arrived here, uh, he had about 20 years of experience. And so I spent a lot of time fishing with, with Joe. And when I took this picture in 1969, I was in a research vessel and we were streaming by and I went by to say hello to Joe. And I wanna put it in here because this load of fish that they have here with rockfish on the top and flatfish on the bottom is about two metric tons of fish. And all the numbers I'll be presenting through this are in metric tons. So for reference, that's about two metric tons. This is the California sardine landings. And the, you can see Julie's name on the one side, my name on the other. And 1966 is when he arrived here. So Julie arrived here in 1926 when this database starts. And you can see what he was dealing with up to essentially more than a half a million metric tons. That time the largest fishery in the world. <clears throat> and that fishery then dropped down to a very somewhat lower low in 1946, had another good year class. And then by the early 50s, the fishery was basically completely uh, collapsed in the north, but they continued catching them in the south. By the time I arrived in 1966, there were very few sardines left. And the sardines that I was sampling that were caught with jack mackerel were all 10 uh, to 13 years old. So those animals were all born back here in the 1950s. And then there's this long period from 1966 until uh, up until the early 1990s 
when there were virtually no sardines in California. And it's possible that at, at some time during that time period, there were no sardines in California and there was only a small refuge of them in Baja, California. And then the second pulse there is the recent sardine fishery, which now has collapsed again. And so one of the points I'll go into later is you can see that the recent fishery is only about a fifth of the size of the original fishery. This is the anchovy landings over that same time period. And you can see the green is central California, red is Southern California, and the blue is Northern Baja California. And you can see the green there, the Monterey, shows that we've never had very many landings of anchovy in, in central California, because this isn't the central habitat for that species. Although they exist from Southern Alaska to the tip of Baja, they're most common in the Southern California bite. And so the explosion in the population of them it started when I arrived in the 1960s, went up to about 140,000 tons in Southern California, 250,000 tons in Baja. And you can see there I have the El Neal on oil content. What happened in 1982-83 was the biggest El Nino of the century. And the nutrition level of all the fishes went very low. So the oil content of anchovy got so low that the processing plants that were making fish meal basically went bankrupt. So there's never been a processing plant for fish meal, fish meal since that period of time. So you can see we don't have very good sized landings after that. This is what Julie's cannery row looked like. And by the time I arrived, the fishery had been down close for about 10 years and this is what Canary Laura looked like when I arrived. This is what Canary Row looks like now. Now, Canary Row, of course, and also a large amount of canneries in Moss Landing were created by the Pacific sardine. And there are only a few small pelagic fishes in the temperate waters anywhere in the world. Pacific sardine and below it is the Pacific herring and the times are very difficult to tell apart. The market squid, which is now the primary landings, northern anchovy, two mackerel, specific mackerel, which is in the tuna family, or actually in the, in the mackerel family, excuse me, and jack mackerel, which are in the jack pattern. And those are about 18 to 20 inches long. Now, here's those landings of sardine again. And so one of the major questions is, why is the second fishery so much smaller than the first fishery? And there's two possible reasons for them, and they're probably both partially true. The first reason is that we did not overfish the fishery back in the 1930s, but when it got down to a very low population, we were grossly overfishing during the 60s and early 70s. And the fishery actually wasn't closed until 1972. So one possibility is the population got so small that even when good environmental conditions came back, they couldn't reach a high population level because they just were starting at such a low level. The best, second possible reason, which is undoubtedly partially true as well, is protected species. When uh, this is a series of uh, a paper that I put in for the Pacific Council, and it shows the historical sea lion population trends. The first sea lion census was done in 1928. You can see that red figure there. And there were only 2,800 California sea lions in California at that time. When I arrived in 66, there were 10 times that many. In 2008, there were 100 times that many. And, the, and then the, that doesn't include the estimate from Baja, California, it was about 81,000. So it's likely that at the present time, there's somewhere just under a half a million sea lions. Now, during that first population outbreak, sea lions were consuming 
about 13,000 tons of forage a year. During the second peak, they were consuming over a million tons of forage per year. And then now they would be consuming about 2 million tons. So it makes it very hard for a pelagic fish that's preyed on by these animals to get a large population population if there is this large amount of protected species. Now, it wasn't just sea lion that were depressed. All of the marine mammals were at very low levels with the exception of the porpoises. And the marine birds were also decimated. And so they had very low populations in 1928. They actually used to harvest bir bird eggs at the Farallon Islands to sell in San Francisco. This graph is from a ecosystem model, sardine ecosystem model, that was done by support from the Packard Foundation a few years ago. And the paper is done by Cohn and several others. And they basically did this model there at the University of Washington they're looking at all of the animals and what they eat and calculating uh, the amount of food taken by the various animals. And the key forage species in the California current are sardine, anchovy, herring, other forage fish, juvenile fishes, market squid, Pacific mackerel. And when you add those, all those together, <clears throat> you get about 9 million tons of forage being consumed in total. And in comparison, there's about 50 million tons of euphosids being consumed. Now, when you break that into fishes, mammals, and birds, you can see that the fishes take about 5 million tons, the mammals take about 3 million tons, and the birds take about 1 million tons. The fishery takes about 173,000 tons. And the anchovy fishery, <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, during the time period was only taking about 8,000 tons per year. So you can see the fishery takes a very small percentage of the forage uh, <clears throat> that are consumed by the rest of the, the biomass. This breaks the anchovy consumption by animals up by species. But this is the amount of Anchovy consumed by seven by salmon, about 132,000 metric tons. Common myrrh, one of the birds, 100,000 tons. Sable fish, 21,000 tons. The fishery only took 8,000 tons. And then we come down here, we have the marbled merlet, which took about 1,300. Well, there's been an people who have been arguing that we should close the anchovy fishery down to protect the marbled merlet, which is an endangered species. So if we didn't take that 8,000 tons, what would happen is that the marbled merlet only takes one tenth of a percent of the total forage. So if we actually took the fishery and close it entirely, the marbled merlet food would go from 1,307 tons to 1,315 tons. Obviously, that's not going to make any difference. Yet these kind of arguments are used to try and close the fisheries down. Now, when the sardine fishery collapsed, Julie was left basically with nothing to do. So, at that time, he switched over and started working on rockfish. And so from a, the early 50s up until the mid 60s, Julie put most of his work in on rockfish. And the first work he did, which is the, a fishing game bullet in 104, a review of the rockfishes of California, which he published in 1957, was probably the most important work that Julie ever did. Because prior to this time, there wasn't even a book that you could use to try to identify all the various rockfishes. And here's the basic problem. <clears throat> there are about 90 species of rockfish, and they're unique in that they have live young, they don't lay eggs, they have larvae that they distribute, and a few of the species live more than 100 years. And any place along the coast, 
there's about 60 species. And this is actually taken from Canada. So basically, how do you tell all these animals apart it was impossible to handle at the uh, where they were being landed. And even the biologists couldn't do it until Julie put his book out. Now, all those were red, but the red inshore species you can see are often dark. So here's a vermilion rockfish, wing cod, a kelp rockfish, black and yellow rockfish. And those prices on them are the prices that they get for them at the live market. And they get quite large. This is a Boccaccio, a wing cod, and a vermilion rockfish. And that's my grandson. As the populations were monitored, starting uh, most of the data was taken after 75, but they were able to run this back into the past to about 1960. And the total accumulation from the biomass estimates came up to about 2.6 million metric tons of bottom fish off the west coast of these 22 species. Here's the list of species. So I arrived here about 1966, and at that time, the, the, the top here is what you would have with no fishery. At that time, the population was down around 2 million tons. And then in 1976, the law of the sea, we, the US continental seas would run out to 200 miles instead of 12 miles. And at that time, there was a lot of money provided to fishermen to build boats. And so shortly after 1976, new fishing boats started appearing. And you can see the change in the slope where it was going down gradually here. After 76, the population started declining rather sharply. And there was overfishing occurring from the mid 80s clear up until the early uh, 2000. We put really strenuous uh, restrictions on the catch and the population recovered much faster than we thought it would. And now it's up to about 60% of the unfished level, which is where they will try to hold it. This shows the Central California trawl landings from 1981 to 2008. And you can see up until about the mid 90s, we were landing five to 6,000 metric tons a year with a value of five to six million dollars. When the regulations were put in, the, the catches went down. There was a small amount increase here. And then by 2008, we we're landing less than 1,000 tons in Central California. So I'll come back to this figure again. That's two metric tons. And so uh, if you wanted to have just a small fishery, I would argue that you should land at least two of these a week in a fishing port. That would mean you would land 100 metric tons a year of say chili pepper rockfish to have just a small fishery. That's just landing one like this a week. So here's the Santa Cruz landings in 2019. There are a total of 67 species landed and the total landings were 197 metric tons. So none of them reached that two tons per week level. Salmon was the highest, but 87 metric tons. The other 66 species, they only landed 93 metric tons the entire year. Moss Landing is now the largest port in the area. Their total landings were about 8,500 metric tons. The great bulk of that was northern anchovy, about 77%. Market squid were 1,300, about 16%. So about 95% of the total landings were northern anchovy and market squid. And the only other two species that landed more than two tons a week were sardine and sablefish. And you can see salmon didn't make it. If you add up the other 87 species, the total landings were to only 224 metric tons. 
That means that they were only landing of these 87 species 4.3 metric tons per week. Monterey, total landings in 2019 were 3,700 metric tons. Northern anchovy were 70% of that. Marcusfid was 24% of that. And sardine was 2% of that. So there are only two species, anchovy and market squid, where there are more than two metric tons landed a week. The other 58 species landed, total landings were only 114 metric tons, which is 2.2 metric tons per week. But you can see the fishery in Monterey Bay is essentially collapsed. Now, principal reason for the collapse is overlapping regulations. Part of that was because they uh, wanted to rebuild the rockfish very fast in comparison to their life history. You have animals that live to be 60 years old, you would expect them to recover very slowly. So they put in very stringent restrictions. At that time, they were supposed to rebuild stocks in 10 years. And of course, that would be impossible for an animal that lives uh, 100 years at maximum age, practically. So what this map shows on the right is Monterey Bay. And this is the area closures to trawl fishing for bottom fish and other types of commercial fishing for rockfish. The brown areas are marine reserves. This is Yankee Point on the left here. That's the point Lobos Reserve and the Big Sur uh, metro, uh, protected area. But those are permanently closed, the brown areas. The blue areas were closed to trawling. The green areas were closed to trawling and all other bottom fish. The yellow areas were closed to all other bottom fish. And so essentially, the entire covered area there that's in color, the trawl boats were excluded from. So there's no place you could fish anywhere near Monterey with a trawl fishery, and the trawl fishery went bankrupt. So when we came back and the areas were altered and some of the areas open, then the state of California came in and changed the regulations that they had before. Before these protected areas and uh, the rockfish closures came in, you could not trawl within three miles of shore. And if you look at down on the map here, you can see this is the three mile area here. Get up there, here's three miles. Now there's an artifact in Monterey Bay because it's less than 24 miles across. And by international law, a bay that's less than 24 miles across state waters is a line drawn three miles off of that point, Point Pinos to off Point Santa Cruz. So essentially this entire area inside of this, all of this area is now closed to rockfish or any trawling. Now, when they first put in the closed areas, there is an area here south of Yankee Point where you can see the green area is here. And they had a special permission to fish from Yankee Point down to about two thirds of the way to Point Sur to within one mile of shore. So essentially the yellow area out here, they would set in nets here and they would trawl all the way to Yankee Point. And that's where that set that you saw on the San Giovanni was taken. He was trawling along that area. That area is now closed. So essentially there is nowhere left that you can fish. Now, why did they close down the inside three miles to trawling originally? It wasn't for biological reasons. It was because there was interference between the cat, crab fishery, Dungeness crab, and trawl boats. If you were fishing on the shelf in shallow water, you would be catching lots of crab pots. So the crab fishermen got the regulation put in back at probably in the 30s, so that you couldn't trawl inside three miles, so you wouldn't take crab pots. However, for a period of time, 
trawling was considered to be very bad. And there were very few studies done on the effects of trawling on the bottom, see if there's any long-term damage. Now, luckily, a professor at, uh, at UCMB at uh, the local state college here, named Lin Lindbergh, did a study on a single boat that was fishing in Morro Bay. And he went in and trawled experimentally and then went and sampled with uh, sampling gear and, and with cameras to see the effect on the bottom. And the net result of that study was if you're fishing on soft bottom, there's very little damage to the bottom curves. Now that's not true if you're fishing on hard bottom. If you're fishing on hard bottom, you'll be taking corals and damaging uh, some of the life there to amount. So the place to really trawl is on the, the continental shelf, which is now almost entirely closed. So this looks at the principal species in the Monterey Bay area from the time Julie came again with me coming in 66. And I've included salmon uh, at the bottom as well in green. So you can see when Julie arrived in 1926, there were no salmon caught in Monterey Bay. And by 1936, there were only very small quantities. And that's because they didn't learn to troll for salmon until the 1930s. So the fishery for salmon in the 1920s was all in the river and it was concentrated near Pittsburgh, California. And that's why a lot of the Italian families in Monterey trace their origin to Pittsburgh because they fished salmon there and then they moved to Monterey to fish salmon. Now, the rockfish landings, as you can see when Julie first came, were about 5,000 tons, much higher than any time since then. And one of Aunt, the only paper available for the species composition in the early years was a paper that Julie did. And he basically showed that the principal species that were caught in this early fishery that was based on set lines, not trawl nets. The early fishery took primarily Boccaccio, chili pepper, and split nose rockfish. And then there were another other four or five species, vermilions, uh, and several others that uh, would provide three to four percent of the catch. You can see that in 1936, there is greatly reduced. That's because that's when the Sardine fishery was going full bore, and basically the markets just didn't want very much fish. So total ground fish levels dropped sharply from 26 to 36. By 46, the salmon fishery was going, the green at the bottom, and they started taking increasing numbers of sable fish. That's black. Sable fish are a unique fish. There's only two in the family. They're only found in the North Pacific, and they uh, essentially, the juveniles and young animals live about a about a hundred fathoms. As they get older, they market in the deeper water, and the concentration of them is in, at 200 to 400 fathoms. And I've caught them line lining up to 800 fathoms, so they're they get very deep. Now, in 1966, when I arrived here, there was a quite large rockfish fishery in the blue there. There was a nice fishery for souls, and there had been a drop off in the amount of sable fish. By 10 years later, the sable fishery came on very strong. They had about the same amount of rockfish. And that fishery was based on export to Japan, where sable fish is very high demand. And they primarily wanted the older fish, which have an oil, high oil content. And then we overfished the stocks during the 80s and 90s. And you can see that we continued fishing for sable fish. So 2006, we have a large amount of sable fish caught because you can still fish in deep, deep water. Rockfish is very low. And then when you look at 2009, you, can, you, you, you barely see that little red mark down there. There are only 52 metric tons of rockfish landed in Monterey Bay ports. In, 2019. That's 32 different kinds of rockfish and a total landing for only 52 tons. 
Now, when the stocks were considered rebuilt in the er about 2010, uh, these are a number of statements that were put out by the Monterey Aquarium Seafood Watch. One of them was that new and updated recommendations for September 2014 include cabazon, crab, dogfish, groundfish, grouper, etc. The most exciting news is that all groundfish caught in California, Oregon, Washington are now either a seafood watch good alternative or best choice. This reflects a tuning, continuing pattern of improvement for US managed fisheries. And the report highlights showed that all trawl and longline caught rockfish have been upgraded from a void to either good alternative or best choice. Major flatfish species, including Dover sole, English sole, Pacific sand, and rec sole, have been upgraded from good alternative to best choice. So souls as a group are now considered best choice by the Seafood Watch. This shows the sole and sand dab catches from Bodega Bay all the way to San Diego. And the data that I've compiled go back to 1969. And I only put in every five years because I had to pull the data by hand. And you can see the peak of the sole fishery uh, in the Bodega to San Diego area was about 5,000 tons in the 80s. And then as the trawl fishery got smaller and there were more closures incurred, we got down to only about 1,000 tons being landed. Uh, by about 2008. Now the species that were overfished and the only uh, overfished sole was petroli sole, all of these are now considered very healthy species. So where did we land in Monterey? Well, Monterey sole landings in 2019 were 609 pounds. And the total landings from Bodega Bay to San Diego were 157 metric tons. That's only three metric tons per week. That's not much more than that one bag of rockfish uh, that the San Giovanni had in that first picture. So again, wh while everyone's running around saying we're, we're gonna have to have some sustainable fisheries, we do not have sustainable fisheries in Monterey Bay. They've been regulated out of existence. So if you want to catch, you want to eat fresh fish and you live in Monterey Bay, the way to do it is go out and catch them yourself. And if you aren't a fisherman, send your daughter out. That's my daughter fishing off of uh, Pebble Beach. She was out actually yesterday and got a limit. Or go on a party boat and you can get them. That's my grandson. Uh, he's out fishing on a party boat today. He's a deckhand on one of the Monterey party boats. Now, there's a lot of uh, controversy about maintaining habitat uh, for protected and particularly endangered species. And so I wanna make a contrast about maintaining habitat for animals versus maintaining habitat for fisheries. This is a picture of the Farallon Islands and it's completely protected, has a very large population of marine birds. And a lot of the marine birds in the area are bred uh, at the Farallon Islands. In Southern California, there's a large amount of area that's completely protected on the Channel Islands. This is a shot of showing the pristine area presently uh, on the Channel Islands. This is taken at the San Miguel sea lion rookery. There are close to 80,000 come into this each year. I think that's the correct number. So essentially for these protected marine birds and mammals, what you need to do is protect primarily their breeding grounds. And if you do that, you, you've really helped them a considerable amount. Well, we have done that by putting in uh, parks and 
uh, national marine sanctuaries and closed areas on most of the islands in California. Now in central California, the essential fish habitat are the Moss Landing Harbor and the Monterey Harbor. Uh, in recent years, the Moss Landing, uh, the coastal pelagic species, that's sardines, anchovies, squid, have provided 94% of the port landings and about 64% of the dockside value. The Monterey Harbor, about 88, 89% of the landings are coastal pelagic species, anchovies, squid, sardine. And 44% of the dockside value. So essentially we have to somehow, and I don't know how this can be done, get to the point where we actually start to realize we have to protect some of the habitat for fishermen. Because when you sell your fishing boat and some guy from <clears throat> Silicon Valley comes down here and puts himself a big boat in your slip, that means that there's never going to be another fishing boat in that slip. So once you lose fishing boats, really difficult to get them back because it isn't just the boats, it's the experience of the fishermen that's necessary. Now, I mentioned Joe Panisi. Uh, I spent days fishing with Joe Panisi on the San Giovanni. He basically taught me the rudiments of trawling. I then took the research vessel, uh, the Schofield, which is a hundred footer, and was trawling in Southern California back in 1972. And the gear I was using was confiscated fishing gear taken from fishermen for using too small of nets. I had five of them. Sorry, I had four of them. In five drags in Southern California, I destroyed four nets. That's because I didn't know the grounds. Two of the nets were fishing in the channels. We picked up solid garbage. We got big boil, big barrels of oil. So if you don't know where you're fishing, uh, you really can destroy your fishing gear very quickly. When I was working in the Indian Ocean, we were trawling with shrimp trawls uh, in the Gulf of Oman. And there again, I spent most of my time repairing nets because we were racking them out on pieces on the bottom because I didn't know the fishing grounds. So you can't just start trawling without knowing what you're doing or you'll go bankrupt. Well, that pretty well covers what I had to say. Thank you. So no, sure. There we go. Hey, Sean, do you have that picture of Julie Phelps? Yes. Can you put that up? I meant to do that earlier. So there's a photograph of J.D. Phillips. This was taken in 1936 on Monterey Bay, and he's actually uh, tagging sardines, which was a program created by uh, a wound biologist for fishing game named Francis Clark. And it was uh, and it was a pretty aggressive program for its time. And uh, they brought the bay and they get fish for the fishermen, or they cut them themselves. They brought them onto a little boat where they would again weigh them and measure them, sex them, and then she would open that fish up right on, underneath this anal fin with a small scalpel, and then they would insert a little number metal tag into the sardine. This evidently didn't hurt the fish when they did this. Then they would take firecrackers or cherry bombs them over the side of the boat to scare away all the fish. So they dumped the sardines back on, into the bay. And she had installed, Francis Clark did, in all the reduction plants in, in Monterey, these big 50 pound magnets. And once a week or so, a fishing game got to go through to pick up all the stuff that the magnet had picked up. Uh, a friend of mine, a guy named Bill Ripley, who was a fishing game biologist, who went to work at fishing game in 1939, he was actually a student at Hopkins uh, prior to that. Well, that was his job. And I said, Rip, what kind of stuff do you get? And I get this bucket full of nails and screws, an old piece of track and old tools, all the stuff that came up from the bay in the, uh, uh, that came up 
uh, with their nest, and he's trying out to find a little number of metal tags. It actually was a really effective program because of that program in 1939, Francis Clark was able to say, uh, you need to shut this, you need to cut this fishery in half, but nobody paid any attention. Uh, they had no power at that time. All they had, all they could do was make recommendations. What are we looking for for time, Sean? Uh, we got about 10, 15 minutes. Okay, let's show some of those photographs. Can I share the screen here? Yep. Wait, where do you go? Okay, share the screen. Where's my thing here? Hang on here. Well, maybe I can't. <laughs> um, you. All right. There you go. Well, where's my thing? Here we go. Oh, got it. Nope, wrong one. I'm not very technical. I don't even drive a car. All right. So here we go. So these are some other photographs that Julie Phillips took over his time in Monterey. And he oftentimes, I mean, he really was, a besides a brilliant scientist, he also was a, a really brilliant photographer. And I used to say that, you know, he had the, the eye of an artist and the mind of a scientist. But oftentimes when and special species were caught, he'd be called and he would go and photograph these sort of unusual things. This is a photograph of a guy in L.A. Yenny. This is Mr. Yenny here. And his family is actually taken in, in his garage in Salinas. And he caught this fish. Uh, which was then, this was in 1948, it was referred to as a Willoughby's ragfish at that time. I think it's got a different name now today. Uh, uh, and it was a deep water fish. And he went and he put, photographed this wonderful photograph. Uh, and actually, I think he even wrote a paper about it. See what else we got here. So here is, the, and there's no rhyme or reason to these pictures. I just put them in uh, uh, as I had them. So here are they are unloading sardines in Monterey. This was early uh, 1930s. You can see the boat, look how low he's sitting in the water right there. He's got a boatload of sardines in this on his boat right there. This is the sardine hopper here, and he's dropping your sardines into the into the hopper there. And this is inside an abalone cannery on the Monterey Wharf. This is 1938. All these uh, Japanese women working in the canneries, uh, working on the wharf. In, in the abalone canneries, it's all abalone. Abalone was huge, huge fishery in Monterey. Uh, this is a guy named Freeman Whitey Arbo, who was a basking shark fisherman. And he's standing at the tip of his boat here, getting ready to actually harpoon a basking shark. This is also 1948. And I interviewed Whitey about this, and he told me that he rigged this, this thing up uh, just specifically so he got hunt basking sharks. And they said, once, once soon as this picture was taken, it actually broke and he fell into the water. Uh, this is uh, uh, a remarkable photograph. This is Monterey's past, present, and future in the fishing industry, uh, all in this one picture, 1930. So here is a what's called a Lampara boat, again, referring to the type of netting that it used. This is, uh, is a half ringer or Japanese round haul. And then this is a purse saner. A brand new purse saner, again refers to that type of netting without the turntables. These are two brand new turn, uh, purse saners with the turntables. And so the net would be piled onto the turntable, then they could turn it. And now I was told by a couple of different fishermen that in Southern California, the turntables are turned to the right. In Monterey, the turntables are turned to the left. I like to think that's a political thing. Uh, this is a little known uh, fishing game uh, sea otter exercise program. No, actually, this is a, unfortunately a dead sea otter. This was a, early, this was a, right after the raft of sea otters that were discovered down in the Big Sur Coast area in, in the 1930s. Uh, although Fish and Game always knew those sea otters were down there, they just didn't tell anybody because they were concerned people would go after them. Also, all the abalone divers knew that those sea otters were down there as well because uh, they used to complain because the otters were going after their, after their abalone. The divers used to refer to them as sea cats. And then here is Monterey's version of the, uh, of the sardine Titanic. Uh, this is this one and only voyage. So Newt Hobden, when the sardine fishery really collapses in the late, in the 1950s, he went out and purchased one of those big, uh, big military um, uh, landing crafts, kind of carry tanks and things into, uh, into the 
onto the beaches in, in Europe and also in the Pacific. And he actually converted it into a flow into a sardine cannery. The idea being this would go out and meet the meet the boats and bring the fish up on this fish ladder. And he had to rig it all in here so they could can all the fish and getting ready to go. Uh, this is taken off Mars Landing. This is his only voyage. He only they only did it one time and it just was not very effective. Of course, the fishery does collapse. This was a photograph taken by Julie Phillips uh, in Santa Barbara, because the boats had to go further and further south to get these sardines. So they're putting them onto trucks and trucking them up to, into Monterey. This is actually Hogan Cannery uh, in, in the 1950s. These are all truckloads of sardine that they're now that they brought from Santa Barbara back to Monterey <clears throat> to load them in, but to can them here in Monterey. That didn't last very long because they just couldn't keep them fresh. It just wasn't very effective. To do that. Again, this is them at Hovden's cannery and pumping in sardines uh, into the cannery there. These are a couple of basking shark fishermen, uh, also taken about 1948 or so. Uh, and this is their converted uh, sort of pleasure boat they take out. And then you see the barrel back here. And so they would uh, harpoon the basking shark, for, and the barrel was I have a line onto it that was attached to the harpoon. And as the shark starts running through the water, it would drag that barrel, which would slow the basking shark down. We also saw Jaws, remember that movie there. And then uh, here's a couple of beautiful uh, boats taken at the Monterey, uh, Monterey Wharf. This is the two brothers, which eventually will also become a basking shark boat. And then here's a couple of basking shark fishermen. That is not a basking shark, of course, that was a great white shark. And these guys were uh, bass shark fishermen. They caught this. This was taken at Hopkins Marine Station. And on the back of the photograph, I remember this, it said that these guys were paid $50 for bringing in this great white shark. By the way, this guy's here, his name is Bill Tomlinson. And the other guy here, his name is Jack Daniels. And here's, the here's an abalone boat. This is the mother boat. And there are three of them there actually. And they're coming in. These guys go out for three days at a time. And then they come back into Monterey. Uh, and then, by the way, abalone season would change from season to season, but it could be very long, sometimes like nine months. Uh, and the abalone, they bring in 200 dozen large red abalone. And there were, by the time this picture was taken, there were at least nine different Japanese companies operating off the Monterey Wharf. The Japanese dominated the Monterey Wharf part of World War II. This was taken in 1938. Here's another photograph of the abalone boat and these live boxes. That's how they kept the abalone fresh. And they're bringing it back up into the cannery. And this is in the abalone cannery uh, 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 on the Monterey Wharf. And they're pulling the abalone out of the shell. And then here's a beautiful picture taken in 1926 uh, when they're building uh, wharf number two. And so that's the corrugated building that's out there today as it was being built right there. And these beautiful Monterey clippers you see right here. And this was taken when Julie first came to Monterey. And then again, inside that Monterey cannery, and they're slicing the abalone steaks. That's what those guys are doing right there. And then they're bringing in, I believe those are mackerel uh, coming in and uh, at the Monterey Wharf right there. This is about 1935 or so. And then starting fishermen uh, washed down their net right there. You can see the turntable. And this is one of my favorite photographs. Anybody recognizes this? Of course, this is the cove at Hopkins Marine Station. These are a couple of fishermen here, and they run a, a gill net along out here. And it's a net you stretch across, and he's and the fisherman here has a big rock, and he's throwing the rock into the water to scare the fish to swim into the net there. That's what they're doing. And then here's a group of fishermen on a Lampara boat going out the sardine fishermen. And there are 14 guys on this boat, and there is no technology. I mean, there is no radios, no depth finders. The most technology on this boat, these guys would take a piece of steel, put some lard or butter on, on into that steel, and tie a rope around that and drop it into the bay, then pull it back up. And if there's sand stuck on the end of it, that meant they could lay out their net because it isn't rocky down there. And then here's some squid fishermen in the 50s fishing right in the middle of the Monterey Harbor. And then there's some squid being pulled into the sardine hopper. And then here is our fishing game biologist. Again, that is Frances Clark right there. She is a woman way ahead of her time. 
She was the first person within fishing game to receive a PhD, which he got in 1925. They weren't sure what to do with her. So he made her the uh, librarian. She later went on to run all the sardine programs that Fish and Game did uh, here in California. And this is a guy named Lance Schofield. This is Richard Croker. This is a guy named M.J. Linder. And then here's our friend J.B. Phillips right here. This is at an annual uh, clam census that they would do. I, I was told it was really an honor to be invited to go do that. Then here they are again at, at that clam census. And here is Francis Clark. Uh, and all the boys right there. And then there's J.B. Phillips again at that, at that, uh, uh, that sardine, sardine um, tagging program there. I'll see you there right there, Sean. And then as I mentioned next month, I'm going to show quite a bit more photographs, some really unusual things, things that most people aren't used to seeing here. John, I don't think we have time to take any questions, but I'm happy if anybody has any questions. Yeah, we have, um, as long as you want to stick around, we yeah. have time for, if anyone has any questions for Richard or Tim, um, please feel free to unmute yourself. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for another thank you. great uh, history tour. And Richard, thank you so much for taking time to join us. We pre greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank and you, Richard. And to let everyone know that we will be back here um, next month on the third Thursday of the month at four o'clock. And we'll be talking a little bit, we'll be diving more into um, exactly. JB Phillips. We are. Thank so, you very much. Thank you all and uh, hope to see you next, next month. All right, thank you.